This episode is brought to you by Windrose Recovery, a family of premier addiction treatment programs in southeastern Wisconsin. Privately owned, Windrose Recovery offers a full continuum of personalized care for those struggling with addiction, including the Manor for residential treatment, Midwest Detox for inpatient detoxification, and Windrose Counseling for outpatient treatment. With highly personalized treatment focused on trauma, Dr. Chantel Thomas and her expert team offer an authentic experience, creating the kind of deep emotional change that's crucial for long-term recovery. If you or someone you love is struggling with addiction, call Windrose Recovery at 414-409-5300. You can learn more about Windrose Recovery by clicking the link in the show notes or by visiting windroserecovery.com. Thank you for listening to The Path to Authenticity. My name's Tom Gentry. I think of this show as the opposite of small talk. You'll hear real conversations with real people who know who they are. We talk about what makes them who they are, how they became who they are, and how we might become truer expressions of who we are. I'm Karen Casey, and this is The Path to Authenticity. Nowhere to run, nothing to hide from the government's prying eye. Take yourself a Soma holiday. The Path to Authenticity proudly supports the I Speak Media Foundation, advancing media literacy education through an evolving series of outreach programs within the communities that need it most. For more information, visit ispeakmedia.org. If this is your first time here, thanks for checking it out. If not, thanks for coming back. I'm Tom Gentry, and this is The Path to Authenticity. Episode 123 for May 11th, 2021. This episode features a conversation with the author Karen Casey, who's written a lot of books in the self-help genre. And it was really nice getting to talk to her. A couple months ago, I got a text message from one of the guys in this support group that I host. He's also a very loyal listener. He sent me a reading from a book written by Karen Casey, and it reminded me of this interaction that I had with her years and years ago that was really meaningful to me. And I talked to Karen about that. But when he sent that, it was during the time when I was kind of really seriously thinking about doing this episode with my mom. And and, uh, the story relates to my mom. And and I just knew I wanted to have Karen on the show. And I'm really glad I did. We grew up in towns about 40 miles apart from each other, which I didn't know. Prior to this conversation, our high schools played in the same conference. So toward the end of this, we get into what that was like growing up in sort of, in Indiana, we called them cities, but, you know, compared to like New York or Chicago, they're not, they're more like towns, but, but they're, you know, sort of mid-sized communities in the Midwest and there were some special things about it. But anyway, it, it was a great conversation, and I'm glad I reached out and got her on the podcast. I appreciate her doing this, and I hope you enjoy it too. Here you go, Karen Casey. Government's crying eye. Take yourself to Soma 
You know, you and I've met a couple times over the years, and but we've never really gotten to know each other or anything. But I just want to give you a little <laughs> synopsis of my memory of you and kind of where it fits in the context of my life. Okay. Okay. So, so you're a, you're a writer and, and you've spoken over the years at many, many women's conferences specifically pertaining to recovery. And, and part of that was a series of conferences called women healing. Right. Which, uh, at its height was a collaboration between the Betty Ford Center, the Karen Foundation, and the Hazelden Foundation. That's right. And and I started <clears throat> my um, career in the addiction treatment industry working at Hanley Hazelden in West Palm Beach, which is where I got sober. And um, I worked in the marketing department there for a couple years during which time we hosted the Women Healing Conference in West Palm Beach. And, you know, it was, I was about 28 years old, and I had never really had an opportunity to spend time with authors, and I just, it, it felt like such a blessing to me to be able to do that. And, you know, around the same time, at Hanley, we had hired uh, Stephanie Covington as a consultant to train all of our staff in the women's program, which included me. Uh huh. And so I got to know her a little bit. And then she was, I think, the keynote at that speaker. You were one of the speakers. Raquel Lerner was another one of those speakers who right. I stayed in touch with all these years. And, um, I was the young guy in the marketing department charged with, okay, Tom, you're going to videotape all the speakers. And, and I was kind of the utility guy at this, you know, if anybody needed anything or anything like that. And it was just a really memorable experience for me and, and a special memory. Lots of great things. One of the things that stands out to me about that is – if you remember this specific conference, there was a building being built next door to the Marriott in West Palm Beach. It was kind of a mess outside the entrance. I know I now live in that building. Oh, do you? Ne next door to that hotel. So that was about 2001, 2002, something like that. But another thing that happened is, you know, you've written – people listening should know you've written a lot of, uh, of meditation books, like daily devotional, inspirational readings. And I, uh, you know, they always have a bookstore at these conferences and you were speaking and I, and, you know, being a sober guy, my mom started going to Al-Anon religiously when, when I got sober at 23 and, and I heard you and I thought, I'm going to buy one of her books and I'm going to ask her to sign it for my mom. And you wrote something like, yes, I remember you just very, what's her name? You know, and, me telling yeah. you, and you wrote something like, dear Martha, your son's a testament to what a remarkable woman you must be. And I, it almost tears me up to think about it because, you know, we put our families through so much. We do. We do. And uh, it's been such a gift to me that my mom is so proud of me. Oh, that is wonderful. And, and with good reason, Tom, with yeah. good reason. Yeah, yeah. But, but to, to be able to give her that, like a memento like that. I mean, it must have been one of her prized possessions all these years. You oh, know? Um, yeah. And so anyway, I do a men's group once a week and, uh, and you know, we text each other and send each other readings. And one of the guys sent me a reading from one of your books a couple of weeks ago, which reminded me of all this. And I thought, I got to get Karen Casey on this podcast. I'll be doggone. Yeah. And what a small world. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. And so, you know, you've also written uh, a daily reader 
pertaining to the Course in Miracles. That's right. And right. that is right. Which is dear to my heart. And this being, as we speak, it's the fifth Wednesday of the month. Um, and my Course in Miracles group meets every Wednesday of the month, unless there's a fifth Wednesday, in which case we take that off. So instead of being with them right now, I'm with you. I'll be doggone. Isn't that, I do a, a, a group, uh, on Zoom every Monday night. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had a, uh, I facilitate a Course in Miracles group in my home in Minnesota and here in Naples for oh, at least 25 years. And now because of uh, quarantine this past year, we moved it on to Zoom. And so we're still doing it on mm -hmm. Zoom. And, you know, it's just, it is such a core part of my uh, spiritual program, you know, yeah, A.A. Al-Anon Al and the Course in Miracles. It's like yeah. my life would be a mess without all three. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the group that I attend, it's the same thing. You know, it used to be face to face until, till we were forced to, to, well, you know, we didn't have to go to zoom. We wanted to, you know, we wanted yeah. to keep meeting. So, right. um, and it's, uh, you know, I've referred a little bit to the course in this podcast and, you know, I, one of the things that I haven't talked about, I guess, that really stands out to me about it. First of all, I knew about it for a long time before I ever went to a group. And over the years working in the helping profession, it seemed like over and over again, I would meet these people who I had a lot of respect for and admired. And at some point I'd learn that they were a student of the course. Mm -hmm. So then when someone said to me maybe five years ago, Hey, how would you like to go to this group at this lady's house? And I was all over it. And, Oh, sure. And, uh, you know, I'd always kind of been looking for an opportunity to do that. And so I went and yeah, I really didn't know what to expect. Uh huh. Uh, but you know what I got was showered with love. Yes, that's what happened, and I, and yeah. it just felt so good. Right. And, oh, uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and so you know that's how do you not keep being involved in that? That's you know? right. It's, it it's it's really something special, and it's helped me a lot specifically in my interpersonal relationships. Right. I think that it can be the core uh, guide guiding line for holy relationships. Right. And as the Course says, every relationship starts out as a special relationship, right. but special not in a good way, special in a bargaining way. Right. Uh, and, uh, and fortunately, every Every relationship then has the opportunity to become a holy relationship if um, if the partners involved really seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Right. And and so it's it is it's just um, it makes such a difference in our lives. Yeah. And then it makes a difference in all the lives that we touch oh, as yes. well. Yeah. yeah. You know, another book that I wrote, besides the daily meditation book, I wrote about three years ago a book called 52 Ways to Live a Course in Miracles. And in Minnesota, there are lots of groups that, um, uh, book study groups, people mm -hmm. who are meeting uh, and using that book because every, because there are 52 essays and people are using it on a weekly basis. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it it has um it has become um a really core study guide for a lot of people. I love that because yeah. you know anyone who's ever looked at the Course in Miracles text it's dense and heavy oh, and it is. It's, it's it is. I don't think it's meant to be read by yourself. 
I agree wholeheartedly. I, I think that that's the reason I think that um, course groups, uh, study groups are so important. And um, and I guess that was one of the the inclinations for writing that particular book was just my own, you know, my own realization at how much easier the course might be were those principles uh, given a little bit more substantive explanation. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, I, I didn't really know what to expect, but I gave a talk uh, at the retreat in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. uh, and it just kind of mushroomed. And they, I, they invited me back for three years in a row to talk to a few hundred people each time wow. and it kind of it kind of developed then into these book club groups that um, meet to study that book so you know everybody is searching for a way mm. to really live more love-filled lives mm. and and you know I think that the quarantine has really um, given that an extra boost. Mm -hmm. Because people have felt somewhat lost. And, you know, I think those of us who have been in 12-step groups or course groups or whatever have really been on the lucky end of the quarantine because we have had this opportunity through Zoom to continue mm -hmm. uh, meeting face-to-face. -face. Well, and you uh, you couple that with... Um you know, being a member of a 12 step fellowship kind of, it goes without saying that you've dealt with some adversity. Right. And so, you know, there's always a silver lining. Right. And, and, uh, and for me, it, it has been fascinating to watch, first of all, because I, I feel like, I feel like we are, ha we all have been searching for something. And, um, and a, a more meaningful way to live. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this, this shutdown has forced us to reevaluate. Exactly. Am I happy? Am I, is this what I want? And now what saddens me is the people who've gotten angry and I want to get back to normal. Well, you know, like there's a Brene Brown quote out there, like, <laughs> I don't want normal. I want something new that we create from this. Right. That's better. And, right. And that's the opportunity it has given us. And, you know, I do this, uh, this group and, you know, I've had clients who were working in corporate America for 40 plus years. And, you know, I mean, before the quarantine, you know, we're talking through their anxiety related to workplace politics or whatever. And then all of a sudden they're working from home for 90 days and, oh my God, I feel so much better. Yeah. And maybe I don't want to do that anymore. Right. And I think the, the, the luckier of us have that. You know, I mean, I, I feel bad for the people who don't have those kinds of options. But I think for a lot of us, we we get an opportunity to examine what's happening. And is this what we want? Right. And but you're right. You know, there, not everybody is so lucky when we think of all of the individuals who are struggling terribly to figure out how to pay rent to how to keep from getting evicted, how to put food on the table for their young families um, because they're essential workers and they don't have the option that so many of us have had. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's been, some of us have had, um, have found the quarantine comforting in an interesting way. And there are those who have struggled so with it mm -hmm. because they haven't been able to find any comfort at all. Mm -hmm. Well, and myself, I mean, I, I have, 
I've worked from a home office since 2010. And, uh-huh. You know, I've a lot of outside appointments, a lot of travel and stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I've worked from home. Yeah. And so it wasn't all that foreign to me. It's, uh, you know, there's been some time where I some days like, OK, you got to get out of the house today, even if, if even if it's just to go to Publix or whatever. And I'm right. I like my solitude. So um, it's been I mean, I've kind of eaten it up and it's been a opportunity for me to really dig into creative stuff and be right. focused. But yeah, I mean, dep- if you're an extrovert, man, this is tough, yeah. you know. Well, you know, I've always been a fairly social person. Mm-hmm. However, I didn't realize how much, um, how much I didn't really want always to be that social person. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have, uh, I feel like I have, um, really been blessed by all of this. And actually I ended up writing a new book that will be out May 11th. It's already on Amazon, oh my God. but I was, I was needing, um, I knew I wanted some new focus and I also, as we were talking about, you know, the search in our lives always for greater peace, uh, which is why so many of us turn to A Course in Miracles, mm-hmm. I ended up writing uh, another meditation book. Okay. And, um, and it is a meditation book that's called Each Day a Renewed Beginning, okay. Meditations for a Peaceful Journey. And it it really is, it it really fed my need. It nourished me daily to sit and and um, just allow. Well, my writing is really allowing God to work through me. It mm-hmm. just nourished me daily to sit in those uh, quiet moments with God. And listen to a peaceful message and um, and write it down. Mm. So, you know, I, uh, I I feel like there were so many things about the quarantine that um, that really fed me in a way that I had not expected. Mm. And, you know, in my relationship with my husband, um, you know, we're we're both in recovery and have been. Um, I'm soon to celebrate 45 years, and um, you know, it it is. Um, I I didn't know how much richer our relationship could be mm-hmm. until this period of time, until this last year together. Wow, what a gift! Yeah, it has been such a gift for. Joe and myself and our dog, our, we have a yellow lab named Nellie, okay. who will be six years old, April 7th. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So it has been, it has been just a joy in so many ways. I mean, you know, the quarantine has resulted in such disastrous things when you think about uh, 550,000 people in our country alone dying. I mean, it's just the sadness of that is is almost beyond belief, and and yet that's juxtaposed with uh, some good things that have resulted as a result, uh, the good things that have resulted in spite of the pandemic. Mm. And so I I think it really gives you a reason to pause and s- remember that within the midst of of um, sadness and struggle, there always can be a light. Mm. Um, And some of us, I think, have been showered with the light. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, so many thoughts. Um, We, when we go through adversity together, we become closer to each other. Right. And the AA big book, there's a, I'm going to butcher it, but, you know, where it talks about we are people who ordinarily would not mix. Right. But we've gone through a common peril. 
Right. It mentions some kind of shipwreck analogy. I can't remember exactly, but surviving it together, Mm -hmm. you know? Right. And, um, you know, um, just like I've been thinking about, I had lunch with a family yesterday, a mom and dad who's, who reached out to me a little over a year ago to help place their son. And I kind of coached them into getting him into treatment and have stayed in touch with them. And somebody said to me, well, you know, it's really nice that you stay in touch with them. And I wouldn't think of not, you know, right. <laughs> I mean, right. we've been through something big together, you know, right. And, um, and it matters to them and it right. matters to me too. It, right. It's just such a gift. It is, yeah. you know, our, our connections with others, um, I think are always a gift mm-hmm. and we often don't even realize it in the midst of it. Yeah. But, um, but I, I, in, in my long, long journey, long life. Mm -hmm. I I really have come to, um, to, to believe to the tips of my toes that every encounter I've ever had with anybody was quite intentional for, um, for, for, for a reason, um, that was important to each of us in that encounter, even though we might not have known it at the time. Right. And, and, you know, that's the beauty of hindsight. Mm. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been at this place where lately I've, I mean, I'm, I'm approaching 25 years of sobriety, which oh, just, wonderful. just like, I can't even believe it. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just, I would have never thought, and, you know, a couple of years ago, it felt like a big deal because it was 23 and I got sober at 23. Well, half my life yeah, now, sure, I've been sober, sure. but 25, man. And, you know, most of that time I've been working with people and, you know, I've always wanted to kind of um, keep some degree of humility about, you know, seeing myself as, you know, People have called me an expert at times and it has made me really uncomfortable. Right. But, but, you know, 20 plus years, I mean, I'm starting to like become more, wow, Tom, you've really been doing this a long time. Yeah. But then you, oh my gosh, you've been sober for 45 and it's, uh, it's just remarkable. Well, you know, and, and for each of us. It's important to um, to to actually never forget who we were and where we came from, mm-hmm. and and how um, and how it happened that we got here. Yeah, you know, I I don't I I don't know your journey, but I certainly didn't end up in Alcoholics Anonymous because I chose <laughs> that. <laughs> it was it was really kind of a uh, uh, kind of an accidental suggestion. Yeah. And, uh, and I went and I had been in, I had started in Al-Anon in 1974 because I was really intent on trying to, uh, change somebody else's drinking habits, having no <laughs> idea that, uh, that you I entered was through the back too. door as we said. Yeah. Right. And I, I had no idea that, you know, I was a daily Jack Daniels drinker, yeah. but I had no idea when I went to Al-Anon that I actually was an alcoholic, right. uh, too, but it felt so good to be there mm. because it, it felt, um, it felt hopeful and accepting. It felt like nothing I had ever been to before. Mm. And then, uh, sometime later when it was suggested by a counselor that maybe I needed to go to AA after she heard a bit about my story and I, I walked in Tom and I looked around and the place was, was um, it was men and women and they were all about my age. I was um, just 30. I hadn't even turned 36 yet. 
And uh, I looked around, though, and I thought, yeah, this is a place for me. Look at all these good looking men. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, uh, yeah, I thought, man, was she right? This is exactly where I need to be. And that was um, that honest to God was why I went back. And because of the good looking men? Because of the good looking men. (laughs) And I had no, from that very first meeting, I never, even though I had been a daily drinker for many years, Mm -hmm. I had absolutely no uh, urge to ever take another drink again. And that was totally, um, um, felt like a mystical thing. I mean, it was like, I don't get it. I don't get it. And um, when you experience that, you know, cravings and it's just such an overpowering thing to to have it be removed. Right. It's a huge deal. It is. It is. You know, it's funny. uh, The good looking men thing. Uh, uh, Over the course of my career, there have been many times when uh, people have said to me, well, you know, he's not going for. In, in the work context, he's just going to meetings to pick up girls or whatever. <laughs> and and you know what my response has been? So what? Yeah, he's right. going. He's yes, going. Yes, right. And, right. And, you know, there's a there was an old friend of mine who you actually may have met over the years, a guy named Jim Emmert. Who, that um, name's familiar. Yeah, he but... worked for the Karen Foundation for many years. Okay, but, okay. But, um, but he he used to say, you know, there's not a wrong reason to do the right thing. Absolutely. Oh, I agree with that so wholeheartedly. Yes. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's funny that the you know the whatever if that's what kept you going right right thank right. God exactly yeah so um, now. So you were 36 when you stopped drinking? It, well, I yes, I, I was, um, let me see, it was in 1976. I was either 35 or 36. I the, My first AA meeting was May 24th, wow. 1976. So, so what was it like before that? Well, you know, as I said, I was a daily drinker. I was... I had been uh, married to an alcoholic for 12 years, Uh, you know, and we were uh, equally uh, uh, had a a crazy disrupted life by Mm -hmm. alcohol. We um, I we married in our senior year at Purdue University. Um, I went to Purdue as an undergraduate. Yeah. I studied, I was in psychology, but because we got married our senior year, my my counselor, or my advisor, I guess they called him, said, you know, you'll never get uh, a job without uh, a master's, so you better switch into something that will get you a job. Mm-hmm. So he suggested I go into education, and I did, and um, I became a, a teacher uh, I, and actually I loved teaching. I taught for eight years. I taught for three years in, in Indiana. In fact, I taught at the same grade school that I had attended as a kid. And, uh, and Karen, then where moved. are you from? What town are you from? Lafayette, Lafayette, Indiana. I'm from Kokomo. Oh, you're kidding. No, <laughs> I'll be Which doggone. is 30 miles away from each other. Right. I'll be doggone. Yeah, yeah, Lafayette, Indiana. And I, I taught at Oakland School. Okay. And then I, um, and then Bill and I moved to Minneapolis because he um, wanted to go to graduate school. And he had already gotten a master's at Purdue. And um, so we moved to Minneapolis because he wanted to get a Ph.D. in American studies, which he didn't ever finish. And as a matter of fact, I then did go to graduate school and did finish mine. Hmm. So uh, which was a totally also a totally unplanned uh, 
I mean, I had no idea that that's what I would do with Mm -hmm. my life, which is why I'm so convinced that God always has a plan. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we're the last to know just what that plan is. (laughs) Or Um, even realize it needs to exist. Right. Yeah. Who who knew? Except that when our marriage ended, I was really at a crossroads and I kind of thought, what what am I going to do? What do I need to do? Because it was a devastating breakup for me. It shouldn't have been because it was a very troubled alcoholic marriage. But I was clearly um, very codependent and uh, went in, fell into one bad relationship after another, but I thought, what am I going to do? I guess I'll go to graduate school. <laughs> and so, and I mean, that's it with just that, you know, that kind of thought, well, I guess I'll just go to graduate school. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, um, started graduate school and then ended up getting my PhD also in American studies. Mm-hmm. But the journey was so strange, Tom, because I had not been a a great student as an undergraduate because I was such a party girl. And um, I had been on uh, probation, in fact, for social probation at Purdue because of my drinking escapades. And so uh, I, you know, when I started graduate school, even though I was still very actively alcoholic, I miraculously, and I truly mean that, miraculously, was a a straight-A student. Mm -hmm. And and that, and and I often think of the promises and God doing for me what I could not have done for myself. Mm -hmm. Because I don't even know how that happened. But suddenly everything felt easy. And that's where I really discovered the absolute transformation that writing gave me mm-hmm. because you know in graduate school any anybody that's that goes the thing that they kind of um hate most is all the papers you have to write mm-hmm. for every single and in american studies you had to write a paper a week mm-hmm. and um and i absolutely loved it mm-hmm. it was it was as though Although I didn't realize it, I wouldn't have said this said this at the time, but I look back on it, and it was as though I was made for that journey. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, who knew? That was the farthest thing. You would never have convinced me mm-hmm. as a kid or, or while I was at Purdue that one day that's who I would become. That's how my life would change. But it introduced me to what became the rest of my life as a writer. Well, you know, it's um, for me, I don't know that I'd say I love to write. That's something I've pondered a lot over the last few years. I mean, there are times when I feel like overcome with it where I need to write. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've never been the person you described who just agonized over writing. It always just came to me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I didn't struggle with it like other people did. And, and it, it just like, to me, it was almost like putting a jigsaw puzzle together or something, Uh just fitting pieces together. And, um, you know, but yeah, I can, I can relate. Um, yeah. With that. Do you know how lucky? Yeah, you know how lucky you and I are that that it it works that way for us yeah. because most people do agonize. I know. Even I know. even people who are great writers who have published a lot talk about the agony right of writing and um and I look at writing as nourishment right you know. Well, I will say that um, that's something that I never, never quite resonated with me because, you know, like Hemingway has quotes about something about bleeding all over the page. Or, you know, yeah. there are all these <laughs> quotes about that. Right. But um, I am at a place where I feel compelled to write about really difficult, painful stuff. Uh-huh. And 
it's hard to sit down and do it. Uh huh. You know, the really tough stuff. Right. It's hard to sit down and do it. Um, but also one of the things I've learned is, um, I used to beat myself up for not having written a book yet. For a long time, like many years. And uh-huh. and finally it hit me about five years ago. You know, you couldn't write the book you need to write. You needed to go through what you needed to go through right. in order to write the book that you're supposed to write. And right. something I write now, I couldn't have written 10, 15, 20 years ago. Right. And I would rather write what I can write now than right. what I could have written then. Oh, I so understand that. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it's it's really it's a it's a funny thing writing. You know, when do you write, Karen? What time of day? Um, you know, as I can I can really sit and write any time of day. But when I am working on a book, now this one is done. I've finished all of the editing process with the publisher. But when I write, now it's usually in the morning because it's real energizing for me. But, um, you know, when I wrote each day, a new beginning, for instance, um, you know, I didn't sit down to write a book for women. Mm -hmm. That was never my intention. And that was what, uh, has been such an interesting part of the journey for me as a writer, because I, That book was really my attempt to communicate with God because I would go to AA meetings and feel a sense of comfort and well-being. Uh, I would feel um, part of the cocoon uh, of AA, and then I would leave and go home to my one-bedroom apartment and feel absolutely... um, absolutely lost. Mm. And it felt as though I couldn't connect at all. And so I spent a lot of time struggling with that. And in fact, had um, some very, well, had one very, very close suicide uh, plan in place until it was interrupted Mm. (laughs) by a knock at the door, Uh, quite an intentional knock. I know I don't have any doubt. But it was the result of that that um, that I knew I just had to keep reaching for God. Mm. And for me, it, it became apparent that to sit and open myself up to a conversation with God was the only way I would ever actually find a connection. And so I began to write, and that's what became each day a new beginning. Mm. And um, and you know, I I I would have to say, even over all of these forty five years, and and I've written thirty books now. Oh my I, goodness! I didn't realize you'd written that many books. Yeah, I um, I I know best God's presence when I am writing. Hmm. So probably I remember when I saw free the book free I mean the movie Frida about Frida the, Frida the painter. Yeah. Yes. And I remember if you'll remember at the very end, you know, she had such terrible, terrible back pain. Mm-hmm. And at the very end she was laying on her side in bed, still painting. And I remember saying to my husband, you know, I have a feeling that that's me <laughs> in old age. Oh, wow. I'm still going to be sitting someplace, maybe not leg on my side, but sitting someplace writing simply because I have to. Mm. And and that is how it feels for my life. I'll, I'm, I don't suppose, I mean, I can't imagine that I'll ever stop. Wow. That's so great that you have that. Yeah, I feel really, um, I feel really, I don't doubt but what I have been called to do this. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
I mean, that sounds, I, I, I hope our listeners don't think, well, that sounds weird, but it, you know, I think we're all called to do something. Yeah. I think that our purpose is quite intentional and it does feel like, um, this has been why I was born. Mm -hmm. wow. I never was able to have children and, um, I had many pregnancies, but I was never able to have children. And so I've always thought that, you know, I gave birth to books. Well, I was going to say there are authors who call them their children these days. Yeah. Right. So it feels like I've had a whole house full of children. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, um, it's funny because... Having written, like from a journalistic standpoint, prior to recovery, and then getting in recovery and, you know, seeing all these books that people write about their um, journey to recovery, right? Um, to me, I always thought, I'm not doing that. I don't want to do that. I don't. I don't want it to... I don't want to do the same thing everybody else is doing, first of all. And, you know, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to want to have an angle that somebody else doesn't. Right. And, you know, so it really, it's been this question for me. Um, if I write, what do I write and why am I writing? And, mm -hmm. and I, in the beginning, I, I never wanted to have it be, I always felt like, it needed to be in service if I was going to mm -hmm. do it. It needed to be in service to another human being. Mm -hmm. And so as the years have gone by, um, you know, I've working with clients, working with as a counselor with people or with groups or managing a facility, you know, the sphere of influence gets bigger, right? It just can for me, it has continued to grow. And so for me, the logical progression of that has become this podcast, my writing, so that I can help more people. That's right. it. That's the point, you know? Yeah. And it's funny because I've also like ba back to like seeing – ourselves as experts or me seeing myself as an expert and kind of struggling with that. If I write in this context, you know, what, what voice am I comfortable taking on? What's going to feel right to me? You know, we all as writers, we have to find our voice. Right. And, um, and so I don't even really know how I stumbled upon it, but I realized a few years ago that writing the stuff that you're talking about writing comes naturally to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've written, I've actually, I submitted a book proposal at the end of oh, 2019. Wonderful. And I oh, kind of, yeah, yeah. So I kind of knew it was going to get, I didn't think it was going to get picked up. I've, I've always felt like it's the second book. Uh -huh. the, the Daily Reader is the second book that will support whatever the first book is going to be, which I don't know yet. But but I have written a number of daily meditations and and it just it feels good, you know. And one of the things that I've tried to do, being someone who got sober young and working with young people, I feel and being a writer, I, I'm really careful about the jargon I use or, sure. or don't use. Right? right. And and so part of what I've tried to do is write the lessons that I've learned in a way without using the recovery jargon. Uh-huh. So, you know, first of all, the, the, the young people who are trying to get sober, it doesn't scare them off. Right. But also... It's universal. Right. These are exactly. all things anyone can benefit from. Sure. And, uh, and you know, when I've – most of what I've written – well, I at first I thought maybe I want to write a men's, and I've played with that. But, you know, that seems – to me it seems like a 
a way to limit myself that I, you know, I don't necessarily need to do that, but, right. but you know, I'm, I'm still figuring it out, but sure. I love taking a quote and commenting on it for a couple sure. paragraphs and, and coming up with an intention right. for it. Well, that's um, great. And that's, that's, yeah, I, I encourage you to keep pursuing that. I will. That, I will. That's yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'll send you. I'll I'll send you a couple that I've written. And, oh, uh, I'd love to see them. Yeah, it's um. Yeah, I have. Uh, I'm an idea guy. You know, yeah. I, I have lots of ideas, and uh, you know, part of what I need to do is manage my time differently so that I can devote mornings to writing. Uh huh. You know, right now, I have to rearrange some things where I can. You know, I've been trying to manage my life so that I can afford to do that, so that I can, like, I can make money at different times a day so that the stuff that's going to take longer to yield an income, I can do. Right. Um, so, but I'm, I'm getting to the point where I need to double down on the writing stuff and spend more time sure. doing it. You know, what I really like to write more than anything is sort of personal essays. Yeah. And uh, and people and that's what people honestly people love to read those. Yeah. Yeah. Like I love Joan Didion's stuff. Oh yeah, I do too. I mean, she is masterful. She um, is. She's just one of those writers that I mean, I feel like I'm a pretty good writer, but I don't know if I could ever write like that. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> few of us can. Right, she right. Can. And she's just achingly honest, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. Uh, and, and you know that slouching toward Bethlehem, the essays in that book just—they uh, are there. It, it, some of the things she talks about, you know, and uh, you know about self-respect and you know being married and those. I mean, just some of the. She comes out with some of the most uncanny but powerful sentences of anyone i've ever read it just yeah unexpected sort of statements that just are so strong yeah and you know i mean we both love words right right I mean, it's like that's either you do or you don't and i'm definitely that's one right. of those people who just loves words right um so Wow. So you just finished a book that comes out in May. And then do you have any other projects in the works or where, where are no, you with it all now, Karen? No, um, I, I don't. Um, I'm sure that that something will call to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't um, I don't have another project on the back burner right now. Um, I think that because this is. It's this one is on Amazon already uh, to be released May 11th, but I'm sure something else is going to call mm -hmm. soon thereafter. Um, I just am not sure what that might be or uh, how it might how it might materialize. Right. You just got to show up. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So right, do exactly. you write every day regardless? Um. I used to. I don't. I don't write every day now. Um, I. Um, I mean, lots of times if I'm not writing anything in particular, I'll just sit down and write a Facebook post or something. Mm -hmm. I love writing every day, just because it soothes. It do, it really is soothing to me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I don't necessarily write every day. Uh, and actually, with Zoom meetings, I, I have 12 different meetings that I go to wow. a week on Zoom. That's so, uh, yeah. And so that plus just preparation for life in general and um, doing all the things that one does just to keep life going mm -hmm. um, takes a lot of time. Um, it does, doesn't it? But... But writing, writing is for me such a pleasurable activity mm -hmm. so that there's never a sense of, oh, gosh, I need to sit down and write. 
you know, that's never how it's felt to me, even from the very beginning. And, you know, when I think back in graduate school and all of my friends would just moan and groan right. about about writing papers. And and I, I can still remember how I would look at that and think, my gosh, um, that's not my experience at all. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I think that whatever our experiences are, they really are. Uh, leading us in the direction we need to go. Yeah, yeah, like we have to pay attention to that stuff. We do, and and I think that it's easy to not pay attention. Well, uh, it's easy. Everyone has all their opinions about what they think we should do with our time. Right, you know, right. And And this, you know, one of the things this podcast has made me question, I've always kind of thought, well, I wanted to write, and, you know, but... I really, this just like, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I, I, I'm totally in the moment. I'm not anywhere else. You know, that's, it's not the same when I write now, sometimes right. I'm completely consumed with it when I really am inspired, but, but this, I can just do. And it just, it, it is a pleasure. And, you know, so I'm, I'm still figuring that out, but, but I'm more and more learning that when we see those cues, we have to we have to follow them. Or That's we don't. True. We could choose not to, but we're better right. off if we follow right. them. I was right. sitting with a client a few years ago who young guy wanted to move out west and he had a job with benefits and was maybe sober three or four years and somebody sent him to me and I was meeting with him once a week and well, you know, he he just wanted to be like a park ranger or something. And, every, you know, well, he's talking to his dad. He said, well, you know, how are you going to make it? And, you know, what about benefits? And, you know, everywhere he went, he got discouraged from doing what he actually wanted to do. Right. And at some point... um, you know, I mean, I talked to him about you. It, that's what you want. Right. You deserve it. Right. And and I said, and I, you know, I mean, this was not of me. This was through me. But I told God gave you that. Right. What you want. God gave you that. Right. And, you know, he got really quiet for a couple minutes and kind of looking down. And I realized he started crying and yeah, and I, you OK? And he said, I just never thought about that before. Yeah. And you know what he did? He went out that west. Was the last time I saw him. Instead, he went out and got a second job delivering pizzas until he had the money to go move out west. Oh, and good now for he's him. out west. You yeah. Know? That makes me feel good. Yeah. To have had that, be able to be there for someone like that. Right. That's really what it's about, you know. That is what it's about. However that however we um, guide somebody else, as long as we are listening to our higher power right. uh, and offer the guidance that we're hearing, uh, however we then pass that on, I think is... Um, is is what completes the circle. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy, especially with substance abuse and the stigma and to think about, well, this is about, you know, there's something wrong with somebody and, and, you know, we're trying to help them get better. And I don't really see it that way. You know, I mean, I see it as this is about you having a better life. Right. That's really what it's about. Right. And if you have a better life, you're not going to want to destroy yourself. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, Karen, I could just go on talking to you forever. Oh, thank you. I want to stay in touch, too, definitely. Okay. Um, So, looking back on all this, well, first, I got to ask you, what high school did you go to? Oh, I went to Jefferson High School. (laughs) I, yeah, and and we Kokomo High School we're, and Jefferson High School were huge North uh, Central Conference. 
Oh, yeah. Huge battles. Yes. Huge battles. Yes. You know, my nephew, I mean, my, let's see, my cousin, Mike Paul, used to be the football coach at Kokomo High School. Mike Paul. Mike How long Paul. ago was that? Oh, well, you know, he would be now, let's see, I'm 82, right and now, I'm sure he would be 70. Okay. So he's he probably is has retired, but he was the football coach there for a long time in hmm. Kokomo. Wow. Well, so, I mean, he probably would have been while I was there. If he's yeah, seventy, I graduated he, he in ninety one. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I, I would think that he probably was. Yeah. I remember, you know, the the principal's name was Kennedy, and he had family members who also coach wrestling and football and you know i can't man i'm drawing a blank on the football coaches i played baseball okay and, and of course yeah. in indiana i mean i could tell you who our high school basketball coach was oh, that was course. baseball oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, but the my football gosh, coach yeah. i can't yeah. remember you know yeah but, indiana high school basketball oh my oh, gosh yeah yeah and yeah. you know when i tell people i covered high school sports i mean i got to cover high school basketball in indiana yeah. when it was still one class i mean i got to meet bobby plump plump oh. crump <laughs> which one is it plump or crump you you know who i'm talking about right i'm thinking of of uh bobby knight well no i'm talking about the guy who hit the shot at Milan High School to be to win the game, uh, which eventually the movie Hoosiers was based on. Oh, you remember the oh, little town of I Milan, remember. which is not yeah, far oh, from right, and and that was such a wonderful movie. Yes, yeah, yeah. and uh, but you know it's based on a true story about that little yes, tiny town and that guy Bobby Plump hit that shot and uh, shot underhand against. That uh, you know Oscar Robertson's high school team. It was that was yeah. that was that was something. That was quite a movie. Well, quite, I mean, a wonderful true story. Well, yeah. and it did a. I think it did a pretty good job of capturing the atmosphere of what high school basketball uh, is I think actually so too. like in Indiana. Right, because right, I, I came to Florida thinking, well, Florida's known for football. I'm I'm going to cover some football, and that'll be. Man, not even close. Not right. even close. And growing up in, you know, I'm sure Lafayette Jeff is what we called it. Um, the the gym is probably similar to ours. I mean, my high school gymnasium seated over 5,000 people. Yeah. Like it's bigger than college right. gymnasiums. And, oh, yeah. And, um, man, it was a big deal. Basketball. It was a huge deal. But you know what? Where it was even a bigger deal? The smaller where? the town. Oh, that's true. I Everybody, mean, all the towns. Oh, went. my yeah. gosh. It, it it was so intense and people got so fired up. And, and I, you know, I just I, I miss like walking into the gymnasium on a Friday or Saturday night and smelling the right. popcorn and hearing the pep band and. And, uh, man, it was just so much fun. It, really it was, was so much fun. That brings back so yeah. many wonderful memories. Yeah. And, of course, um, you know, I have, well, some of my first, like, drinking escapades in high school, um, w you know, when Kokomo was really good when I was a sophomore in high school. And we went to the Lafayette Semi-State, which was at Mackey. Oh, Mackey Arena, yep, and, right, and over won. at Purdue. Yep, and won. So, uh, and we ended up losing in the in the championship game. When it, you know, in Indiana, the Final Four is like it's practically like the collegiate Final Four. Oh, Final it is. Four. It's on You're TV. Right. It's at least then it was really it was a you know, and and they played it all in one day. Um, yeah, and and we ended up losing to Lawrence. Central, um, and Eric Montross was the center who went, went on to North Carolina and NBA, and then Todd Leary, who was a prolific guard at Indiana and a, just a lights-out shooter. I mean, they they 
you know, we weren't going to beat them. We had a couple injuries, but, but it's such a cool experience. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, some of those little schools, I mean, winning a sectional for them, people would talk about it for a lifetime. Right. Yeah. It was a huge, huge deal. You're right. (laughs) You're right. Really a special sort of atmosphere to grow up in. And, and it's one of the things, there's a sense of community around it. That's so true. That doesn't exist where I live. Not really, you know, um, and I do miss that. I miss that collective experience. Like I'm sure growing up in in Indiana, you can remember how, you know, the 500, we could never watch it on TV because it was blacked out. So growing up Memorial day weekend on race day, I mean, I'd be riding my bike around the neighborhood and there would never be a point when I didn't hear the race. Yes. Somebody had it on the radio. Somebody had it on the radio. You're right. It was just, and it was the whole month of May. It was. Right. And yeah, I mean, there are a lot of special things about it. I have, I, you know, I kind of, I like my life now. I, I think I'm not meant to live in Kokomo, Indiana my whole life and I'm happy I left, but but there are some great things about growing up in that part of the country. That That's I do miss. that is true. I I yeah. can relate to that completely. Yeah. I still have family there in, in Lafayette. Yeah, and I go. have. When's the last time you've been? Oh yeah, I every time we leave, every time we leave Florida, we go through Lafayette and stay with some family. Okay. So yeah. uh, and and about ten or twelve years ago, we built a log cabin. Uh, outside of Lafayette, real close to where my niece and and her husband live. And then we ended up, because we we knew we would spend time there, and when I inherited money from my mother when she died, I felt like I wanted to just take that money and um, leave it in Indiana. Mm -hmm. So we bought this land and and ended up um, building um, a log cabin, which my... uh, young great niece lives in now with her family so yeah but we are well rooted still in the lafayette area yeah most of my i'm I'm the youngest of eight they're all in kokomo most oh i have some family down here and but most they're almost all there and my mom who one of the things i wanted to do karen is you know having had that experience with you when you inscribed that book for my mom i've been talking to her about being on the podcast uh-huh. and uh and so i wanted to do this and do the episode with you before i had her on and but i'm looking forward to that a lot that's going to be a special thing to do with oh mom. absolutely let me know when that is i will i will where definitely. i can tune in yeah absolutely so, okay well so, looking back over all this, did I already ask you that question? No, no, you started. I started to, to didn't I? Right. I mean, it's here we go. I mean, I, like I said, I can just talk forever. So, looking back over the course of your life, if there was a time when you could give the younger Karen a word of advice or support, when would you have needed that, and what would you go back and say to her? You know, I it probably goes back to when I was really young and very afraid and didn't understand. I took my first drink at 13 and suddenly it felt like uh, somehow things were going to be okay. But if I could have, I would have said to her, you know, you don't maybe need to do that. You will be okay. And yet I wouldn't change the trajectory of my life for anything. Um, but I think that the, the best advice I could ever have given me is to say, you know, you are being constantly comforted Mm. by a presence greater than yourself, because I didn't believe that I wasn't raised, uh, in a family that practiced, um, uh, religion of any kind. I mean, I, I think that everybody believed in God, but nobody talked about it and, Nobody said grace before a meal except the big family gatherings when my drunk uncle would be called on to say grace. Mm-hmm. And um, 
And so, but I never had a, a, that sense that somebody was watching out for me. And I think that, that I'm, I'm struck all the time by the beauty of the epilogue in the Course in Miracles, uh, where it talks about the hovering angels surrounding us. And I think that had I been able to, I would have said, you know, there are hovering angels and you're going to be just fine. Just take a deep breath and keep moving forward. Wow. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Karen. Oh, you're so welcome. It has been a treat for me, too. So thank you, Tom. All right, there you have it. Karen, Casey, hope you enjoyed it. This has been um, one of a f- several episodes. The past few episodes have all been kind of just a lot of focus on addiction and recovery or the need for recovery and family. And so, uh, but the next episode is going to feature an interior designer turned coach named Jesse Carroll. Who lives out in Texas, so it'll be a little change of pace. So if you enjoyed this or any other episode, please take the time to leave a rating or a review at Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, wherever it is you listen, whatever it is they allow you to do to show love, please do. Every little bit helps. If you have questions or comments, you can call 561-247-4757 to leave a message. You might even use it on the show. I'd love to hear from you. Value any feedback you have to offer. For early access to this and every other episode, you can support the show on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash the path to authenticity. Early access to episodes. When I finished this interview with Karen, I posted it right away, unedited. I do something I call the Saturday Dispatch, which is a little short episode that I do for patrons on Saturdays. Usually do some kind of reading or something. So I try to come up with some added value for folks. And really... I just want to get to the point where I can devote more time and energy to this project. Really enjoying it. I loved doing the episode with my mom. I hope you guys enjoyed that. So I want to thank the band Punk Rock Opera, whose music you hear throughout the show. Their songs are used with permission from the artist and under a Creative Commons license. The Path to Authenticity is proud to support the I Speak Media Foundation. Thank you to our sponsors, The Manor and Windrose Recovery. And as always, thank you to Wendy Chen at Equivox for her digital support. You can email the show at thepathtoauthenticity at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram, both at The Path to Authenticity. Please check out the website. Join our mailing list. The path to authenticity.com. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. I realize that there are a lot of ways you can invest your time. So thank you. Have a great week. Be nice.
Authenticity is powered by Equivox. For digital marketing and web design services, visit Equivox.com.